Are are you like pessimistic in general about the future? Uh I'm not pessimistic for I'm pessimistic for institutions, groups, but I'm optimistic for the individual in all forms. Hello everyone. Welcome to this episode of Unfinished Business, a podcast about humanity. Today I'm here with Ajay Warrior. I hope that I pronounced that right. Uh, uh, <laughs> the best-selling uh, teacher. <laughs> All right, <laughs> that was a horrible. That was a horrible intro. So how about how about you introduce yourself? All right, let me introduce myself. My name is Ajay Warrior. I'm a computer science engineer. I'm a best-selling Udemy instructor and founder of Finance Academy, an independent game studio that makes educational games. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much me. Basic intro. You'll figure out more as you tune into the rest of the podcast. Amazing. So actually, let's start with uh, Bananas Academy because uh, I I saw firsthand the 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 at least part of the birth of the, uh, of this company. Um, so what's what's the goal of Bananas Academy? What's the whole story? Ah, the story is weird because I came to Harbor Space Barcelona to do my masters in digital marketing. I got there and the place was entirely entrepreneurial. And before I got there, I was teaching online. Uh, I was I started teaching on Udemy since uh, 2015. I was 18 years old back then. I started basic uh, teaching basic programming. And when I got here, because everybody was entrepreneurial, I was like, okay, maybe I can do something about the education system because I hated my bachelor's degree because I was, I just felt like I was wasting my time there. And because of the entrepreneurial spirit of the place, I was like, okay, let me start a company and go and fix the education system. Yes, I was that naive back then. So it's one year back, but still, yeah. Uh, and initially it started off like, okay, let's create an educational platform where I make online courses, this and that. And then slowly it progressed into something else and we ended up making a game studio and we released our game. It's called Cyber. It's now available on Steam. And yeah, it's doing decent. And in the main thing is in the process, we learned a lot of things. So yeah, that's the cube summary. So where is it now? Because uh, I, I played yeah. your game actually, Cyber. It was pretty fun. You did? <laughs> Yeah, well, I, 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 I downloaded the free version. I didn't even pay for it. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I yeah, it's on like Skid Row, I think. It's on Skid Row, I think. Uh, you can crack it. I mean, the free version. Really? Did already? you pirate it? Yeah. No, no, I downloaded it from your website when it was available for free. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I remember. We had a demo on the website, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I just played like 10, 5 minutes, but it was <laughs> yeah, you, you you can't compare it with the other mainstream games out there yeah, because course, it's a we we were four people and we made it in three months. It is it was a developmental hell. Like the story of making that game was it's life changing. I look back at that game and I have no idea how we made it. Like seriously, no idea. <laughs> yeah. uh, so what, what were we talking about? Um, yeah. The main thing about that game was in the process of this whole mission of trying to fix the education system, we actually, there's a lot of uh, layers of, you know, jargon that we throw around. We're saying the education system, what the hell is an education system? Uh, what, what do you mean by education? So when you actually launch a business in, the, in a particular industry, you actually get to know what it actually means. What is an education system? What is the problem? Is there even a problem? So the whole journey of Finance Academy was actually understanding what it actually meant to have an education system or what, what the hell is an education system? Like we always say education system is broken, but what the hell is an education system? And I had no idea before I started. And now uh, my entire definition of education system is different. What is your definition of the education system? Uh, so I have a contrarian opinion on the education system right now. My, I started off saying education system is broken. Now I feel that the education system is absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Really? Yeah. Okay. Why is yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> so I all, um, you, you must know of Peter Thiel, right? He always talks about being contrarian. And mm -hmm. I always used to think that I'm a contrarian person because I never used to conform with 
I always had my own opinions. But then I, after making the game studio and I uh, just realized that I traveled from India to have a space where there's what, 50 students from inner batch and most people were from different, different countries. We had almost close to more than 90% consensus when you ask, do you think the education system is broken? So when you have more than 90% consensus in something, that means there's something wrong there. Like you, you ask anybody in Harbour Space about, is the education system broken? They'll say yes. Do you think all politicians are clowns? They'll say yes. So what that, what that means is there is something wrong in the way in which you're looking about these things. So what the education system is today is has nothing to do with education. It's several different things. One thing, it is an insurance policy. So it's like, okay, I, I don't know what to do with my life. So everybody around me is going to this college for four years and I'll get a degree which acts as an insurance policy, right? In case I fail in life, this degree will be my backup. So it's not really about education. It's an insurance policy. So that's one thing. The second thing, it's signaling, right? It's a, mm. so look, if you look at major universities like Harvard, the point of Harvard is not studying for four years in Harvard. It's either, it's, it's always getting into Harvard. It doesn't matter if you're a Harvard dropout or a Harvard graduate. The main part of Harvard is actually getting there. So that exclusion factor is the main value that's coming out of that. So that's the second thing about the education system, which is basically excluding people. So you take a large number of people and then you're selecting a few individuals from that. So it's that selection process. It's not teaching people. It's just the fact that you manage to get into something that is hyper competitive and you manage to get it there. So the fact that you manage to get in there is the main value that's provided by these top level universities. So there's that aspect of education. Then there's obviously the four-year party version of it, which is where you just go and you have fun. Uh, so there's that side of the education thing. And if you take school, school is mostly about socializing. It's about, okay, these children are not ready to go into the world. So you put them in an uh, uh, environment where you have to interact with other people and you model somewhat of a, uh, a low-end version of the real world, which is much more safe. And you put them through that for like 18 years and then they're ready to you. Then you throw them out to the real world. So school is somewhat like that, college is somewhat like that. And the real education part, which was funny, because one, one of the reviews that we got when we made that game was that uh, you, could, you could learn programming by reading a book. You don't need to play this game. So that was one of the reviews that we got uh, on our game. And I read that review and I was laughing because it's true. That's how I learned programming. I learned by uh, reading a book. So the main thing is education today has never been better before because with YouTube, you can learn anything you want. Everything's free. You can you can find four different instructors teaching the same topic. So you can always go and find one that suits your type of learning. There's tons of online course platforms which are dirt cheap. Um, and the case was that even back, uh, you know, in our parents' times, there was always library. And library was pretty cheap. So what modern day YouTube is, we had library back then. So education and learning are two different things. We never had a learning crisis. People who wanted to learn will learn, whether that's through books or whether through trial and error or whether that's through online courses or games or whatever. The problem is just that you cannot scale that. I was very egalitarian when it comes to education, but you can't have equality of, like, you, you don't get that. Like, uh, you can't, uh, you know, force equality of uh, education or equality of learning upon people because the students need to have the desire to learn. And no matter what kind of system you create, there's always going to be inequality. You can't force equality. Does wow. that make sense? Yes, it actually makes because because yeah, I'm shocked actually because it's a 180 degree turn from when you used to. Uh, yeah. But um, do you still agree that the education system could still be doing a better job? Or I mean. I'm not talking about YouTube because I believe YouTube is the, honestly, yeah, the, uh, the greatest learning method and the greatest library of, of education in the world right now. And that has never existed before. But, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of traditional school and traditional mm -hmm. universities, there is a, still a lot of counterproductive things that happen in those. So, yeah. is it pointless the, to the try main, and fix those? or uh, The main thing is you can't scale some of these things, right? So the problem is that, um, yeah, for sure we can, uh, like for example, Harbour Space, right? Harbour Space is somewhat different from traditional universities and it works, but you can't scale the idea of Harbour Space. The more people comes in, it just ends up being a normal university. The main factor is that there's few people and the professors are all 
uh, you know, people working in the industry. But if you scale that, if you have a classroom of more than 60 students, then it just ends up going back to the uh, traditional university kind of situation. And it's the same with most ideas. Like, uh, for example, Peter Thiel has a program where he pays 100,000 to students to drop out of high school, drop out of college, <laughs> but he can't scale that. He, he only has that program. He has like, what, 20 people gets in. The problem with this is that you can have good ideas and you can create these small versions where it's perfect, but you can't scale those things to, you know, uh, work for everyone. And it's like that, right? Uh, that It's the same with politicians. You're never happy with them because they have to choose between, okay, should I pay for the homeless uh, shelter or should I pay for, uh, you know, increase the pension of elderly people? And no matter what you do, you're going to get scapegoated anyways. And it's those small things. And if you... It, it, Things can always be better. For example, um, the syllabus can has to improve. And what's happening, sadly, is that a lot of identity politics and uh, social justice warrior things have infiltrated the education system. And it's it's no longer about learning. It's about keeping everybody happy, where you have 13, 13 prize medals and all those things. Hmm. Uh, our education system has gotten soft and heavily influenced with politics. Like recently... Uh, I read uh, some uh, law trying to pass where there are no wrong answers in math. They wanted to oh. bring, yeah, like Which uh, math doesn't have any wrong answers because uh, right answer was the product of male patriarchy or some bullshit like that. Uh, <laughs> you shouldn't. <laughs> so they wanted right? to. The, no, no, this is something but I where? saw recently. In which country? Uh, I'm not sure. I, I'll link you the so, where I found it. I think it was Willet, where they. Uh, yeah, yeah, bro. <laughs> uh, <and even laughs> I, I read it in Quillette, I believe. Uh, you know Quillette? Uh, it's a Claire Lehman. It's a media publication in Australia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they cover almost free speech topics. So I, I read it somewhere. Link you the source. Yeah, so you, you can't keep the politics away from these things. And there's a show called The Wire. Have you heard of mm-hmm. it? I've heard of it's it. I've rega- been recommended. It's, quite often. Yeah, it is. Regarded as the highest, greatest show ever made. Uh, and I would say the director of that, producer of that show, David Simon, we will look back at him in 100 years as we look back at Dostoevsky. He's that good. That bloody good. So there's a fourth season of Wire, which is entirely about education. You watch that season and you know everything that is wrong with education. And you see all the problems. And, and they will also tell you why you can't fix it. Because any system you create, you scale it, it ends up back, being back in the same pathological. Now that sounds pessimistic, but for the individuals, there is there has been no better time. If you have the desire to learn, there is nothing stopping you now. Nobody can stop you. You have well, internet and... Uh, yeah. I, I totally agree with, with that point where, where, where no one can stop you. I mean, uh, you know, for example, uh, I, over the past two months, I started learning Flutter. Um, mm-hmm. And I built a shitty app with, with Flutter. Mm. And now suddenly, like literally a week after I, 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 you know, built that shitty app and presented it in class and, uh, you know, got some feedback. Um, suddenly a world of a thousand, a thousand ideas opened, <laughs> opened for me. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, now, now go, go, going back to one point that you made that, you know, once you scale it, it, it starts breaking um that uh, yeah definitely you can see that in a lot of sectors in the world but what breaks to me seems like w- what works to me uh, for for me seems like the be to be the human interactions so the one on one i have with my with my professor the the one on ones i have with my with my fellow students uh what what tends to break is when you basically uh take it take a human and then program it to to teach the same thing for 20 years so <laughs> would removing uh, yeah. lectures <laughs> and just automating lectures and then and then adding uh, a- another aspect of uh, basically one-on-ones help? Uh, here's the problem. If if I had, so my courses on programming, it's three hour courses. All right. So in three hours, I'm covering the basics. So if you had a really efficient education system, each course would be less than six months. And there is no profit. How can you uh, give away four years of... You can charge students for four years. They have the incentive to keep the study for four years. If you just make it online courses and then you had that one-to-one interaction with people, then maybe we could complete one degree in one year or something. 
but universities have incentive to just keep it running for four years. So there's that conflict of interest there. They are they are rewarded for keeping the students more and more in the uh, campus and like increasing the length of the program and taking more students in, which is which is the main problem. Like you, if you a classroom has sixty students, then it's almost done because the professor cannot individually attend each student. It becomes too much, and that's a problem of scaling these things. And yeah. Um. Okay. But does it have to be four years? Like, uh, I'm not talking about profits. In, you know, I'm just saying maybe it could be uh, usage based, so that you know, uh, for someone it could take six years, and for someone it could take six months, and someone could uh, basically take a six months course, get some work experience, work with peers, talk with peers, learn from peers, and teach peers, and then come back to it a year or two later, and then take another six months course, another five year course, and um, could yeah. could so could we actually scale this on on a level of l education as a lifestyle basically? Yeah. <laughs> uh, my suggestion would be like for universities in overall uh, would be to get rid of all bachelor and master programs. Just make it research based because you're not teaching people to get jobs there. The job working industry, the real world moves at a pace that is impossible to catch up. Because by the time a, a topic is added to the syllabus, it's already outdated, and you should actually move education. Like I like what Google and uh, they are doing. They are starting mm. a somewhat of a university where they are partnering with many companies, and uh, you know they are providing these short courses where the degrees also value because they have partnership with companies and not just that. Uh, you can also go and work in Google once you graduate if you are a good student, and that actually works because. There's, a, there's different reasons why students go to university. If it's to get a job, then we don't need the system that we have now. Because the system that we have now is purely research-based. A four-year degree is useful if you're going for further research. Four-year degree is not good if you are going to the work industry to work, actually. So if you are interested in working, it should be primarily based on either online courses or something like this, like where you do a six-month program and then you get a job. And the main thing is it has to be done by a source who has authority. Like Google has a brand name. Uh, that, that brand name is extremely important. You can't just have random boot camps. You need to do it. Uh, a company that has, uh, you know, a credibility to offer should be doing the thingy. And universities, they should just focus on research. So four years, you can study computer science where you can uh, do a PhD. And PhD can be connected to that. You directly get a PhD. That would be one thing that can fix. But it's easier to just sit here and speculate these things because... Uh, to implement it is extremely hard and we'll see it happen soon because a lot of students are opting out of university because the debt is just not worth it man. I mean I suppose the reason I'm here is because I didn't want to go to university at all and then yeah. um, I was told by, by my parents that okay the, 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 there has to be a certain you still need an insurance policy. You still <laughs> exactly, need an insurance exactly. policy. <laughs> exactly. And also it's just a matter of well for ex I mean I was a bit of a different case compared to the average Iranian, I guess, because my parents never really forced me to, to study. I was always independent yeah. in my studies from like the first grade. Um, and it wasn't really for them an insurance policy necessarily. It was more of a, well, you need to meet people. You need to network. And still mm -hmm. for me, the most valuable thing about university has been, even though I go to like a non-traditional university, whatever, uh, has been the networking uh, effect of it. So right. I'm still sort of stuck on that idea that, okay, let's say we have uh, many, many courses that are done by by companies or people with authority, like Google, like uh, Peter Thiel, uh, and, um, and then students are on their own track of research-based education, basically. Then where does the mentoring and where does the peer-to-peer -peer help come in to this yeah the peer-to-peer -peer thing is it's hard to scale like i said because how many peers can a, a teacher handle like with efficiency so if it's a 15 student class you know everybody you can easily uh you know uh, have a personal connection with each student it works but scaling that to a size of 60 or maybe more that's where it gets very tricky it's the same with mentoring right you want good mentors and good mentors are very few in number and how many good mentors can you get for 
the the equality problem is the main. like you can't scale it to everyone it's good and like for example um, one of the things that you can do is most of stanford and harvard lectures are online for free the only thing that's missing out is that you know uh, networking part like you said and networking part i guess some of it is luck right because you managed to go to harvard space you know you you can afford to go to harvard space and you were in barcelona like so was i and we managed to have that network and networking is somewhat of a matter of privilege right if you're born in us you are in silicon valley then you have networks that is uncomparable with the rest of the world and if you're born in somewhere like a village in india or you know some third world country you don't you'll never get that same level of network unless you actually move to that place where uh, that network can be found but i think the internet has uh you, you won't get the same type of networking where you manage to like sit across a room and then have that conversation and connect with that person but i think uh you know you can have uh, like for example eric weinstein he has the discord server where he's mm-hmm. decent at so you have more chances of interacting with him through that discord server and obviously he's going to have to deal with a lot of people and standing out in that is not going to be easy but at least you have some at some levels you have some more access to people that you would normally ha- wouldn't have the access because of the internet but like i said it's not perfect you can't scale it more networking would be good but i so, don't so know how you do can do you see the expand. whole system moving more and more towards just being less centralized being being more decentralized essentially the decentralization so, so, part is up to the individual so <laughs> uh yeah. one of the uh, analogy that people use is it's, it's like the corrupt catholic church and the answer to the corrupt catholic church was the enlightened enlightened movement leaders they just said uh, it's up to the individuals nullius and verba listen to nobody take nobody's word for it it's up to the individual and i don't have a system that can work for everyone but if you're someone who, want, who understands this is a situation then there are ways out so there is no one cut solution for all of this like some people they want that human presence they want to you know sit in a classroom uh, directly know the professor uh, talk to them sit next to them physically and then learn so some people prefer that like for me at least it's i don't care if i'm physically there i just care about the content i can learn online i learn most things online so i don't really mind uh, having that aspect but for some people that that networking side is important for those people they have to figure out their answer for themselves like you figured out have a space right you mm. you found a university which you wanted and you had to think for yourself that is the main part right i can't give an answer that works for everyone every individual has to think for themselves find ask themselves like sit and ask yourself what is what exactly are you looking for and that's the insurance pol- you have to break the insurance policy cycle the idea of degree is somewhat like an idea of salvation right that the catholic church had you, or if you don't get a degree you are you're going to hell so you need to break out of those side of thinking and you need to start asking yourself why the hell am i getting this degree am i doing it because all of my friends are doing it am i doing it because it's a 4a party like you have to ac- actually ask yourself why the hell am i doing this and you have to find that answer and then decide what to do there's no one cut answer okay then so let me direct this back at you you as an individual why do you teach Oh it's actually a very selfish thing to do because teaching when you're learning something and say for example you know you drop proper university learning is what you learn a subject for 2 months 3 months 6 months and then you write an exam and in the exam to pass if it's a written exam you can bullshit your way out of passing exams like i passed most of my exams here in, during my bachelor's because i had a good control over my language so i would just write what six paragraphs proper english heavy vocabulary and the person who's evaluating those they'll just look at it okay this person has written this much he's right and they will just you can bullshit your way out of uh you can fool yourself like richard feynman says uh you you should not try to fool yourself because you are the easiest person to fool so that's the problem with learning just by yourself you might think you know something but you never know something unless you can explain it to someone else in the most easiest way and by recording courses especially when i'm teaching uh when words come out of my mouth i can actually feel okay is what will what i say make sense to a person listening on the other hand who has no background knowledge of what i'm saying so i can i can listen to myself and i can understand okay is this is this really the best explanation i can give is there a part where i'm just using buzzwords and then i cut down more buzzwords and i just cut it down more and more and more it becomes the most refined way to explain a topic and that just solidifies the way i understand a topic like the best seller course that i had it was on webrtc so it's basically what 
power zoom uh, so it's the technology behind zoom and all those discord zoom all those things it's real time communication over the web this technology has uh, almost 20 years of baggage it has like uh, protocols almost 6 7 protocols that are back in 1997 2000 so to understand how this technology works you need to actually go back and study all those things it's a lot of a uh, lot of connecting pieces and some of the things are here because our routers are uh, outdated as fuck they are <laughs> still using 1990 technology so there's many reasons why some things are there right now and to properly understand this uh, i had to like go and do a lot of research and i had to break down this complex topic into small small individual chunks you have to start with okay how does the internet work what happens when a packet is sent from here to there and my course is entirely that level where i break it down to the ultimate uh, you know the most uh, clearest possible description and that really helped me learn that topic so that's why i teach I, i pick a topic which is extremely hard and then i teach it and in that process of teaching i get very good at it i can so relate to that even though i don't teach because first of all i like to talk a lot and mm-hmm. talking to other people for me about ideas about things i've learned is actually my way of relearning it like uh, i think peterson used this word reincarnate the ideas in my own in my own head um it's sort of like the reason i do this podcast one of the reasons i do this podcast is you know maybe um some of the things i say like 30 seconds after i said i don't i stop believing in it i actually start believing mm-hmm. in the country thing and you know that's a bit of a dangerous thing to do on the internet but uh, <laughs> uh yeah they're know, thinking out this loud this is yeah exactly this is exactly is they're thinking out loud so teaching is basically thinking out loud for you yep and Amazing. not just that it's the thinking out loud that i can keep on refining because i i see the video and i look at oh, what the hell ever me doesn't make sense we can keep back and i trade and i trade and i trade and keep improving it it's the same as writing as well i write every day and i write uh, so i publish few articles on linkedin useless it's the only social media i use linkedin and twitter and i use it mainly because i deleted instagram and everything else uh, and i use it just to write things i write and put content out there because when you write you actually you can't bullshit yourself when you're writing or teaching so these two things are super important to become a clear thinker and if you're not a clear thinker then it's very hard to make decisions especially when you're investing or when you're working in a startup you have to be a clear thinker and you can improve improve the clarity by talking out loud writing and teaching obviously would you consider yourself to be a workaholic uh i have swings you know i am either the laziest man alive or i am extremely like i will sacrifice food sleep and just work like a madman there's no just i'm i'm always in the extreme there's no middle ground for me like right now i'm just chilling uh, i make investments uh, my online course is earning there I, i i have a very simple life here right now but once i get obsessed with an idea then i'm gone uh, those uh, game development days 3 months i was waking up at 4 am sleeping up at uh, sleeping at 10 i had two meals a day and every day i used to eat the same thing egg and oats and my cooking period for that was two minutes and the rest of the time we were just working like like mad men three months of just development hell i i just sat inside that room it was during the pandemic i couldn't go anywhere else it was crazy <laughs> and yeah there's no middle ground for me either i go full on or i just sit back and I sit back and chill and relax so how do you push yourself out of phases of uh, either super unhealthy work or phases where you feel like okay i'm being too lazy and uh, my life is losing yeah. its meaning <laughs> <laughs> So for me at least I have a nihilistic filter and mm-hmm. whenever anything any idea that has uh, you know enough convict that I have enough conviction to break through that nihilistic filter then nobody can stop me when I'm working on that thing like that once I have conviction about something then I just go full on and work but as so that I may have that nihilistic filter to keep me from going after every opportunity that I have so that's my uh, you know it, it it maintains my sanity most things are what the fuck why am I doing it doesn't matter like web rtc for example i wouldn't have made that course if it was some easy topic to teach i looked at it and it's like okay 20 years of of protocols that nobody knows there's nobody teaching this thing i'm like okay i'm on this thing and it breaks the you know nihilistic filter when that happens i can just go and work like a madman and you uh, need to have some level of madness oh yeah for sure cuz i mean i feel like um like So I was working on a startup last year um and then uh, that 
sort of died out uh, by by choice uh, in November. Uh, and then I wasn't working on anything except for this podcast and the YouTube videos, and I was very much enjoying it. But then these past few weeks, I got I got an itch. I was like, yeah, Ram, you're stagnating. You're stagnating. Stop stagnating. Uh, even though, like, I've been learning, like, <laughs> I've gone from knowing nothing about podcasts to having recorded, uh, I think, I don't know which episode, I think this is the 13th or 14th episode. Um it it feels like I'm stagnating, so so I had to I had to really uh, push myself there. It, this is it. It kind of feels like um, like an a responsibility itch, you know. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I just go no. go through through uh, P- Peterson phases. Let's say of of me listening to people like Peterson or or or, or yeah. people who actually Goggins. have done shit with their life. Goggins, Lex Friedman, even uh, like people have done shit with their life. I'm like. You're not, you're not, you're not, you're not working hard enough. Huh. <laughs> yeah. C- can this be toxic yeah. for you? So I have two, two ways or somewhat of a schizophrenic idea of this thing. Uh, one thing I feel is that uh, maybe it's the way in which our brains are wired recently because of, uh, you know, the way in which we are just completely living in a virtual world right now where hmm. the feedback is very instant. Like, if, if it's on the internet, especially social media, it's the, the response is very instant. So our brains are actually being wired to get feedback immediately. Like, and real life doesn't work in that speed. Right? So for example, you're, you're doing those podcasts. Like you said you recorded what, 20, 21, but how many views are you getting? How many likes are you getting compared to, you know, all the people that you follow? So you, that those counts actually make you feel like, okay, Maybe I'm not doing that well. Maybe I need to push more. Maybe I need to work more hard because the results are not instantaneous. And that's why our generation is so addicted with social media and video games. Because in video games, you make an insane shot, you kill someone and you get that, you get uh, points flashing in front of your screen. You, 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 you are a winner and you can see that immediately. But in real life, it takes maybe five years of doing this. You have to record podcast for five years to, you know, see some results. And then you feel like, oh man, I did something. And it's the same with that game. Like while I was working in that game, we had no idea what, what the hell we were doing. But now looking back, like recently I was just talking to my team. We looked at the screenshots of that game and like, how the hell did we make this? And it's something that you look back with pride. Back then you were just looking at it every day. You don't see the value in it. Like six months from now, you look back at these podcasts and you'll ask yourself, how the hell did I make this? You know, that that's one side of the thing. And the second thing is mostly like, uh, you know, Peterson himself says it, like compare yourself with who you were yesterday and not with somebody else. So most of our insecurities come when you compare with other people and, you know, that puts a pressure on you. You're competing with other people. And yeah, at the same time, it's like, okay, maybe you should push yourself harder. You know, this that third side of it, which is like, if you're not, you, you, there's no staying still, you're either going back or going forward. So you need to actually push harder and harder and harder. The Goggins mindset, you know. It's all. It's a schizophrenic version of all three. <laughs> so, h- how much uh, actually? You brought a good good point on on you know growth of a, of a podcast, for example. You know, I've I've accepted that um, this is going to take me two years at least, uh, probably five years. I mean, it took Joe Rogan ten years, ten, twelve years of of uh, uploading three to four times a week, every week to you know become Joe Rogan. Uh, but you know. At some point now, as in, you know, it's at a point where a 19 year old can buy uh, some cheap microphones on, on Amazon uh, and uh, start interviewing people, you know, just just with his uh, f- friends that he met in university and yeah. um, reach potentially thousands, potentially millions of people. Mm-hmm. Where do you see this going in general? Hmm. So there's two sides of it, like just going back to where we were talking about before. One thing to good, one thing that would be very useful is understanding the power law because our brains, they think linearly. So what that means is if you had to get from level zero to level 20, you mad, our brain thinks that, okay, you get to level zero to level 20 by going zero, one, two, three, four, like that. But the real world, it's like zero, 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 one, 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 two, four, 16, 64. It goes like that. So uh, even you're talking about scaling your podcast, getting the first thousand subscribers is going to be the hardest thing from that. Getting the 10,000 will be as easy as 1,000. And from 10,000, it'll be as easy to get 100,000. So it, it actually works on an exponential basis. So it's just doing it consistently to a point where you can help that power law, you know, 
snowball it to a position where you want to be. Now coming back, uh, because everybody can create the content, the competition is crazy. It's very hard to stand out. And like Peter Thiel says, competition is for losers. When you compete, all the profits get distributed evenly. Nobody wins. So it's, it's, it's even more harder to stand out now. And which is why I think you need to build your own small monopoly where you pick a niche where only you can do it. You do things that only you can do it. And you have interviews where which nobody else would ever do unless you did it. So it's those things that will actually help you. Uh, th- those things are going to be even more important as everybody starts doing podcasts and, you know, as the content keeps on increasing. It's like it's like a monkey trying to get attention of somebody else. That's how modern day internet is. Everybody's trying to get everybody's attention. Yeah, it becomes a and crazy rat race. How would you suggest someone like me uh, build that monopoly and find that niche voice? Yeah, uh, I think one thing to focus on is going to channels which are not crowded. Like, for example, if you if you just, uh, like, it's more onto the marketing territory of things. Like, what is the audience that you have right now? It's mostly harvest based, right? So one thing that you can easily do is, because uh, we all of our desires come from outside, just because you, you when you put out more interviews of people from harvest space, every other student will feel like going to your podcast, right? So... Inside Harbor Space itself, you can you can build a small uh, list of interviews from the students, and because all those students will eventually subscribe to you, so that's a small monopoly. And then what you can do is you can always go to these small Discord communities, where Discord mostly Discord because there you can also have voice communications with people. So if, for example, you are exploring virtual reality, you can go to every uh, VR server, and then in those server you can talk to people and you can uh, maybe do podcasts with them. And the thing is, when when you do podcasts, with, like for example, after this podcast is done and you put it on YouTube, I'm going to share it with my friends. So now you not you're not just reaching me; you're reaching every person I know and every person I share. So you can actually scale it small by focusing on small small groups. You can actually scale it to say thousand, ten thousand. And, and here's the thing about YouTube: once you have that ten thousand, thousand, then just you know it gives you those recommendations and it snowballs slowly. It's about finding small niches which you can you know building small monopolies yeah i never thought about actually finding random people on discord because i spend a lot of time in discord but uh, it's the best place it's like yeah <laughs> it's kind of like well like right now I've, I've interviewed a lot of interesting people but it's it feels like it's starting to run out out of this community like what i can tap into there's like maybe yeah. another an, an, another 20 that i can that I can make um but yeah this that's, <laughs> that's a very good there's also another element because uh, we were planning to make an audio-based social media. So we were just researching podcasting and all those things. One thing I found is that people only listen to podcasts of people who are in a higher position in the higher than them, right? So if you if you look at all the podcasts that you listen to, you never listen to people who are in the same position in the hierarchy. You're always listening to people who are some, you at least you think are better than you. Or you're mm. just listening for gossip. It's either one of those things. So people who listen to this uh, podcast is mostly like, okay, what is this person doing? I want to know. I haven't seen him in so many years. So that's one reason. And the other thing is that, okay, they feel like by listening to these people, I'm going to learn something. Like that's the reason why we listen to Lex Friedman and all those Peterson and all those people. So that's one of the barriers that's going to happen because you're not a, you know, publicly well-known person where you're not, Mm -hmm. you're just starting out. And it's very hard to find listeners for something when you're starting out. So it's mostly going to be interviewing people and just getting those people you interview to, you know, promote the content, getting one person at a time, mostly. It's hard to scale because of the, and here's the thing. Once you get like 100,000, 1 million subscribers, people will think like, okay, this person has 1 million subscribers. Mm-hmm. Now you have the social proof where people will start listening to you eventually. So yeah, focus it's... on just getting people. They won't listen to your podcast. The the If you look at the, you know, the hours or minutes people have consumed the content, you will see it's very... You know, it's not that much because everybody likes to talk, but nobody likes to listen unless you're <laughs> listening to someone who you feel like you're going to learn something. from. I mean, hell, even like Lex Fritman, as interesting of of a guy he is, you don't really listen for Lex Fritman because there's uh, 180 episodes. Uh, it's it's yeah. uh, like it's so much content. You eventually like explore all of Lex Fritman, but you're just listening for the guest. Uh So you touched on this topic of, well, each person or each idea has its own little bubble on the internet it's little circle on the internet 
now on the sort of macro scale, you know, we talked about Peterson, for example, he has a massive bubble around him and then a lot of people around him have massive bubbles that are that are that fall under another bigger bubble <laughs> and then there are people yeah. who disagree with them. So I did I believe we're basically creating uh, little universes of ideas and of people on the internet, which feels like at least, you know, being here, you know, we, we can't really know what will happen in six months or a year or whatever. Maybe we can look back at it in 10 years and laugh at how scared we were. But are you scared in general of like how polarizing this could potentially become or already has become? I think what it's doing is it's exposing things because Back when there was no internet, or at least internet was not as mainstream as what we have right now, there were still groups of small cults where people gather together and discuss crazy ideas and all those things. But now what has happened is that it's easier for one cult to find another cult. Back mm. then, it was much more separate. It's not, uh, you know, like if you have a set of people who believe in, you know, Marx or uh, some crazy uh, Stalinist Nazism uh, regime, but and you have someone who is a flat earther, you wouldn't, these people wouldn't meet. But now it's crazy, <laughs> like everybody can connect with each other. But one good thing that has happened is that the violence is virtual now. The worst thing that can happen mm. to you is not get murdered, you just gonna get cancelled. You lose your social media handles, maybe whatever work that you've done on the internet will be lost, but at least you'll stay alive. So that's one positive thing to take out of this, because cancel culture can only uh, attack the virtual presence. Back, it was back uh, like 20 years ago, people would get murdered over, you know, disagreements between their ideas. Of course, you would have like uh, Mussolini's black shirts just walking in the street and murdering people and happened many, many times in many other countries. Yeah. W w are you scared that it could potentially once again lead to actual like real life violence? Uh, so here's the thing, like um, whenever I find someone who's like who I feel is very smart, I go and look at where they learned their things from. So, like I said, I mentioned Peter Thiel before. And Peter Thiel learned uh, from a French philosopher called René Girard. Have you heard of him? Yeah. yeah. So, Girard... From Peter Thiel. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, Girard has this... Uh, have you read his book? Things mm -hmm. Hidden Since the Foundation of the World? Yeah. No. It's, it's, it's very hard to read. But uh, he makes a point where... Which is actually an anthropological truth. Like, he says that every culture was uh, started because of a foundational murder. Where... Conflict between many against many became many against one. And that one got scapegoated and they became a god. And because because of that scapegoating process, peace was restored. And that is how cultures form. So what you're seeing is back then, what people used to do was if there's a conflict in the uh, you know village or whatever, you would scapegoat either a human being or an animal. And you would just escape, you would put all the, you know, all the negative energy onto an animal, you would perform some rituals and then you would just scapegoat them. And that's how peace used to be uh, maintained in archaic religions and archaic cultures. What has happened now is because we have moved, we have a much more civilized society, this scapegoat mechanism no longer works the way it works. It has been, so that used to be a way out of a lot of conflicts. Like for example, it still is prominent but it's not that much prominent because for example if you look at the trump situation what was the collapse like republicans and democrats uh, even republicans hated trump to a certain extent like not all of them were pro trump and so this it was entirely polarized it was a many against many conflict how was it resolved trump got scapegoated the parlor got scapegoated you you took out them from aws everybody got together and just scapegoated parlor and trump and then somewhat peace is restored so and the problem that where I'm going with this is that Gerard says in the end that the problem right now is that as more people understand about how the scapegoat mechanism works, we no longer have a way out of our violence. So as everybody start realizing that, okay, we're just scapegoating this person. It's not entirely his fault because uh, if you look at uh, uh, Trump, how many people went into the Capitol and rioted? It was not, everybody has their own individual responsibility, right? It's a group that's com committing the violence, not an individual. Every individual person has their own agency. So we are not holding every individual as accountable. We are just scapegoating one person. And as more people start realizing that, we will not have a way out of our violence. So that's that's somewhat of a dangerous place where Gerard ends his, uh, you know, uh, his theories. And 
that's going to be the biggest challenge for the internet where how do we contain our violence that can no longer be solved by scapegoating random people it's a question it's no hmm do you think humanity and like civilization in general like our societies our you know, macro societies need a goal to stay unified like a larger bigger goal you know like the space race or you know colonize mars or uh, i don't know whatever it is you know stop yeah, climate change or, or or an idea of a god that unifies everybody mm-hmm. do we uh, need that to the... function as a society yeah so what happened was our in archaic times we had a common idea of the god right it was it was mostly religious there was a god uh, in different cultures it was different gods but that faith in god was a unifying factor that helped us uh, you know do things together but that same idea became pathological as it scale like i said when you scale things uh, it be- it starts to break so the same idea of god and religion that used to be very important like for example uh, most conflicts used to happen like the idea of god like people ask do you believe in god when the real question you should be asking is why did our ancestors need god why was god important that's the real question that we need to ask because every culture had their own good and they were all not entirely idiots so there must be one reason why they all had this idea of god and the answer to that is all of our desires come from outside and it we don't have a, our desire don't come from inside so if, for example your desire to make podcast come from watching rogan and all those people and you're imitating those people and it's okay to imitate when uh, what you're looking for can be shared so two uh, you want to start a podcast rogan wants to start a podcast both of you can do it but when it reaches a point where you cannot share what you want to do like for example you won't, you both want to be the number one podcast only one person can be number one then inst- now you are competitors and what happens with competition is that it slowly starts becoming violent because you cannot you find it everywhere right you can find it in the micro situations like where two best friends doing everything together now they fall in love at the same moment and you can't split her obviously so now they are fighting at each other it's a story that has transcended all time right romeo and juliet it's the same story where two families equally alike same status but uh, because of the they, they are they are fighting because they are alike not because they are different because status only one person can be the most high status is a zero sum game two people cannot be at the top and what that means is you learn by imitating your desires are coming from outside so you need to imitate something that won't imitate you back and god was that you can imitate god god is an ideal that you put in the sky where you give them all the great values that you want them and you imitate them and they won't imitate you back so it's safe mm-hmm. from that reciprocal imitation and violence and all those things and that's why every culture had somewhat of a god because it it was a unifying factor that everybody could have it would push every individual to do good things while it won't imitate back so if you're imitating peter's and you're also imitating all his flaws and you can't equate human beings with god it's also with the parents right you're equating parents with god and that's a that's very pathological because parents are also flawed individuals so you are also imitating their uh, you know parts where every person have their own uh, you know shortcomings so you are also Im- imitating their shortcomings so the god is somebody you can imitate and he has no shortcomings so you won't uh, that used to be the main core idea behind this idea of a unified god but we lost that because people started adding more narratives it was becoming it was becoming more about power and control everybody wanted their god to be the best because people start stopped understanding and the main thing is once you explain god in this way you remove that dogma element and mm-hmm. that dogma element is part of the package right you want that dogma element because that dogma once you explain it in rational terms it doesn't have that same impact which it used to have because if you had dogmatic faith it shields you from all kinds of existential questions and that helps you work and what we have now is just we just misplace god into different places like simulation theory is what so if you are if you have a dogmatic faith in simulation theory Simulation theory is very much similar to the God argument. Simulation, if it's a simulation, then that means oh, it's the same argument, argument essentially. It's yeah, it's the same argument. Layer. It's yeah. the same argument. It's just a modern day version of you know engineered computer scientist version of archaic God. It's the same thing. Mm-hmm. So it's the same. That, that's the thing. Like we just distributed the idea of God into different places. For some people, it's radical environmentalism. For some people, it's uh, uh, you know this idea of utopia. Or we just misplaced it into random places. But the it's very hard to live without having a belief system 
And the problem with this is that this belief system can eventually become pathological. So what that means is living with no belief system. And that's basically one way straight to nihilism. You always have to fight with nihilism because you don't believe in anything. You have to always convince yourself to do things. And that's the modern day struggle. It's it's always a choice between dogmatic belief in something versus, you know, endless nihilism. But what do we do? How do we declutter all of these different, you know, uh, alt, alt, alt religions, basically? Uh... Yeah. yeah, I think, here's the thing. Most of our problems had, were here because we tried to scale one man's way of living to hundreds and thousands. Every ideology, like for example, even Marxist ideology, postmodernism, they're not wrong. But what they did was they, they suggested solutions and promised a utopia. That was a problem. Like uh, at the time of Marx, he was right. There, there was a uh, struggle between bourgeoisies and the proletarians. The wealthy, it's the Pareto distribution. One percent of the wealth is owned by the top one percent, and, and that's that's the way in which hierarchies are structured. He was right, but then he suggested a solution, which was there should be no public properties. I mean, no private properties. Everything should be owned by the government. And what he didn't realize was he just created an, another hierarchy, and this hierarchy is the government, which cannot be now replaced as easily as companies. So the only way to replace a government, which is a, which is by default a monopoly, is through violence, and that's why communism just can't really scale without being pathological. The idea was right, but when you suggest, when you try to suggest utopian solutions and try to scale it, it just becomes equally pathological, and that's the problem. So what so you can do is every side, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Go, go, go. So on the opposite side, you you kind of have like I'm I'm not trying to like compare or anything i'm yeah, just saying yeah. like the, in terms of ideas there's like elon musk's idea of colonize mars not because it promises a utopia even though it could be cool it's very dangerous but if you don't do it you'll fucking die same with tesla and then there's also like peterson it's like take responsibility so that you don't fall into misery not so that you reach utopia that so mm -hmm. basically that that's the <laughs> that's the difference between ideology and just life philosophy yeah, and even with the Peterson thing, like taking responsibility, uh, yeah, why? In one way, you can say that by taking responsibility, it's it's important, and you can make you can always make your environment better. But at, there's always that element where you're stuck in a situation where everything's pathological, like people around you are pathological, the government is pathological. So at the, in the, in those situations, even taking responsibility doesn't always help. And that that there's those problems with these ideologies, like for example. He says, uh, like in the new book, he says, do not be possessed by ideologies, abandon ideology. But the problem is you cannot have conviction about anything if you don't, if you're not ideologically possessed. Like, for example, Elon Musk believes that Mars is important, that he is ideologically possessed with that. And we don't know if Mars is an answer. Maybe in the process of getting to Mars, we're going to blow up Earth. We don't know what is going to happen. There's always two sides of that. But without being ideologically possessed, you cannot have conviction. And where that conviction leads is, we can we can never say, it might be to a better place than where we are today or it can equally turn out worse. But you got to be willing to accept at some point that your idea has gone wrong, right? So like communists, uh, <laughs> sometimes I just go randomly talk to communists on the internet and it's like, they're just not willing to accept that well, how many more experiments do you need? I mean, it's the same with, with, with the other side, you know, it's the same with fascists. Like, how many more experiments do you need? It's Your idea is not working on in real life. It's only, uh, you know, nice fantasy on paper. Yeah, so yeah, this is an interesting idea, which I first heard from Peter, which is like, failure is overrated. Because every failure happens because of many reasons. And most often, you never know what that reason is. You You, you might identify the wrong reason. Because many startups, they fail because of several reasons. It's never one thing. And one of the things that happened to communism was, okay, it failed in Soviet Union. It failed uh, almost in many countries. And as the GDP grew, every country started becoming democratic. So the US thought that China would, they were predicting back in 1990s, that by 2007, China would be democratic. Because, you know, as their GDP grew, uh, capitalism is what's preferred over communism because it's simply the better, at least to the US. And what happened was China, they took the Berlin Wall, fall of the Berlin Wall, the fall of the Soviet Union, and they learned different lessons from it. They learned that, okay, this is the limit. And if you push across that limit, then the whole thing fails. 
and they managed to create their own version of communism which is state controlled capitalism so it's a they took a different lesson from it and they it's not i'm not sure how the people are living in those countries because i'm not sure if they are happy we don't know that we are not there but it's good for the government i'm not sure how good it is for the people but the government managed to uh, you know create their own version of communism which we never thought would work the us was completely wrong in those predictions because today it's still under those totalitarian regimes and that's the thing with commies right like you were talking about that that okay how many more experiments do we need they they took that same reason which we are talking about and they learned a different lesson from it and they can now use that as an argument saying oh it works here and we're going to beat the us especially at the space because us is just fighting itself yeah but at some point when you have so much control over things um you know uh, humans are just more complex than that like it's it's yeah. a little beyond See, just one group of politicians deciding everything the main advantage of capitalism is that it's less violent you can overthrow a hierarchy without killing people like a company can just go bankrupt google if it becomes a stagnant monopoly it will go down because of competition somebody will come and make a better product and then it will die out and without any violence for example we have the legal system where we can sue people so you don't have to put them in a soviet camp or something the <laughs> best part about capitalism is that it's less violent even though it's pathological in many different ways where if you look at the sugar industry the alcohol industry it's based on addiction and making profit but at least compared to something that is totalitarian it's it's less violent that's the main uh, selling point of it by the way you're from kerala right yeah so you are actually kerala. from a communist kerala so you're actually I from a communist state <laughs> how it, does that I work i have no uh, yeah exactly i, I have no idea who is working here and it's it's completely i have no idea how it ended up here in the way it is and the weird part is it's only my state that is communist state <laughs> you know in india there's maybe a couple of other ones but everything else is either uh, it, it, it's it's not communist at all and here i can't blame the government for anything uh, i mean things are working and comparatively kerala is doing good uh, but i'm not sure how these things are working like right now we are getting a lot of you know free um, uh, wheat and this and that there are lots of food that you get for free vegetables this and that I, and not sure uh, how they are economically managing these things and maybe uh, once this uh, you know once this pandemic is over the whole economy is just going to collapse or something I, i don't understand how it's economically feasible nothing makes sense right now and, and the main reason <laughs> is because we don't know what to trust the, i think that's the biggest problem of our generation we don't know what to trust we can't trust anything you can't trust who you can't trust the institutions you can't trust corporation you can't trust the government you, you don't know who to trust uh, even with the pandemic who initially came and said that masks were not useful what the fuck because they wanted to make sure that masks were available for doctors so they initially lied and then they came and said oh masks are important everybody should wear masks and so you can't even trust the world health organization and we are living in that kind of a reality where there is a it's like a another wall being formed like in television you make this analogy with the you know breaking the fourth wall which is you are directly breaking the storyline and talking to the viewer and it's almost like a fifth wall forming in our society where you you don't know it's it's like a pro wrestling show there's some elements of truth and then there's some elements of lie and you just can't see through it the wrestlers are real the ring is real the crowd is real but everything else is scripted the matches are scripted the storylines are scripted the moves are staged but because there is some elements of truth and some elements of lie you just don't know what to believe in it and we're just playing along with this lie yeah but but how is it in like is is it subs is is currently being subsidized by the central government of india or like like yeah i'm not sh- so i had somewhat of conflicting ideas about this one thing i felt was almost one month back nobody was talking about the pandemic it was almost as if we had herd immunity because cases here were going down sharply and it was even less than us and uk and i used to ask myself okay we have almost 10x their population and we have almost you know 1/10th of the number of cases so 
did we actually achieve herd immunity because farmers were going on strikes people were gathering like crazy an election was held where people were just running around in campaigns uh, so is it our be getting a bit too overconfident is that what really happened or is it the government not reporting the number of cases during the election and during the strikes to just you know push the political agenda and now that it's over they are actually repeating the numbers i'm i'm not sure which one it is and another thing that i'm really surprised is who is surprised by this outrage why are hospitals you know why don't they have why didn't they stock up they had so much time everybody knew the pandemic the whole world knew this the pandemic and what i read is they actually sold some of the uh, oxygen cylinders and all those things because they thought that they wouldn't need it again so not sure where who to scapegoat and who to blame here <laughs> but yeah and and the weird part is uh, we are blaming the us for not helping us we are blaming other countries for not helping i don't know if people are just throwing money into india right now everybody's donating cash i am not sure what they're going to do with the money the best thing that uh, i seen is amazon donating some oxygen cylinders which is actually helpful uh, other than that i don't know people are just throwing money and and there's all kinds of conflict of interest the government if they just make this outrage they can get more money in form of donations i don't know who to believe man it's just fucked up like i'm not I'm not even sure there are as many cases as they are being reported who knows who to believe hmm fuck man what a world we live in <laughs> it's it's a crazy dystopian future i mean present i are, are you like pessimistic in general about the future uh i'm not pessimistic for i'm pessimistic for institutions groups but i'm optimistic for the individual in all forms any i'm optimistic for the individual because whether it's education whether it's making money online it's much more decentralized uh, even investing like for example uh you know back when uh before the internet and before cryptocurrencies uh investing was something that was just restricted to uh like the ico icos is basically what ico is angel investing where anybody can invest back then it was only restricted to few amount of people and also the uber rich now anybody can invest if i have 1000 dollars i can invest in uh, a newly come, uh, rising up startup or something and it's based on icos so everybody uh, has you don't have to be a venture capitalist or any of those things and you can still invest in new projects so if you want to become an investor if you want to teach uh if you want to learn look at only fans uh <laughs> e- even e- even sex work is being decentralized and it's good for the individual a lot of individuals are uh making an even youtube what is youtube now they don't have to deal with uh television and corporations if they, if you're creating good content people will watch so i'm optimistic about the individual who has that uh you know determination and will to strive forward and find the uh to look for truth i'm very much pessimistic about groups because groups always look for consensus individuals can look for truth and in a world where there is no we can't distinguish between reality and you know many fake narratives i don't think we'll ever find consensus so what's what's what would be your worst case scenario for the next 30 years worst case scenario uh i'm i'm somewhat sad about the family situation like family is breaking apart and one of the important things that family does is it's a it's somewhat of an insurance policy right because life is fucked up you can get sick you can you know lose money you can uh, fail but and family is always there to support you but as the economy improves as everybody starts becoming rich the people stop putting focus on all those things and that's somewhat sad and we have set up a world where i'm also sad about the you know the fourth wave feminism and all those things where you're forcing women to compete with men when they should not be competing at all they are their own they're special in their own way and you're trying to make them you know play a different role and you're making it culturally you're forcing people into it and you're convincing people that that is the way to go and not sure that it's good for both genders not sure where that is going and just one second when you say uh, traditional gender roles uh, because yeah. i come from a traditional uh, country to me that mm-hmm. sounds a bit uncomfortable <laughs> mm-hmm. what what exactly I do know. you mean by traditional gender yeah hey, let me let me make sure i'm cancel proof <laughs> 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 I, what i tried to say is we want equality of opportunity right but what we're doing now is we are trying to force equality of outcome in certain parts 
and the narrative the pendulum has shifted so far here that we no longer we it's like a uh, you know you, competence doesn't matter anymore do you see that almost across the where you are trying to push certain groups mm-hmm. all those group identities come into picture where like okay uh we would take a statistical approach where okay 50% has to be this year, okay 50% male 50% female and then in those 50% male you need a uh, few from black few from asia few so you are somewhat like you're taking away quality of opportunity and competence that is what you should strive for like any individual who wants to do something should not be restricted to do it based on age gender or whatever uh, group that you want that is what you should strive for but what we have now is we are trying to force equality of outcome and not it's, it's very dangerous experiment that we're doing right now and it's dominated the west and now it's you know spreading across the world because it's because of globalization and i don't know where that is going to end us i don't think we will ever have uh, families or um, work culture that we have ever seen history before it's going to be very weird 20 years from now we're going to see different types of communities form different types of um like for example if you're not married and you're 50 years old who are you, you going to live alone or are you going to uh, start co-living with somebody else so you're going to see all kinds of uh, new form new uh, new cultures form i guess but i'm not sure what word to call it but yeah do you understand what? i mean yeah yeah i mean in almost all cases people who don't at some point settle with a traditional family end up being a bit a bit uh, living uncomfortable lives let's just say uh, but i feel like i'm a bit more optimistic in this regard like for example i'm all again i'm all for <laughs> equality of opportunity and all against equality of outcome uh, but i'm a bit more optimistic about it being actually enforced because once you actually try to enforce things just looking at you know other other things that were enforced through history maybe you can enforce it for 10 years 20 years at some point people will have had enough C- could resort yeah. to wi- violence if it's enforced by governments <laughs> again but yeah. uh, i feel like i'm a bit more optimistic that the people again will actually break the- so so far you know you you mentioned this b- b- breaking the fourth wall and and everyone is just moving with this narrative at some point i feel like people will just say okay enough i'm not playing along with this bullshit anymore uh, stop forcing me to do things and i'm going to just live my own life yeah it's uh, how does that end up like what is that revolution going to be like that's going to be what's going to be interesting to see like uh, if you read uh, one of my favorite books it's uh, notes from the underground from those days so it's it's basically a critique of uto- utopianism where if you have a crystal palace where all you have to do is just eat cake and reproduce you would still take a hammer and smash into things to just see if it breaks and that's where we're going like as you try and create more of you know this utopian idea people just want like i they want to show that they have free will they have this illusion of free will which is very important to them and we are going to see reactions from in form of groups and individual reactions and we don't know where it's going to end up it's going to be certainly interesting i'm i'm very optimistic about uh, like i said individuals and technology in general um uh, not so optimistic about the culture after globalization post globalization culture it's going to be very interesting to see where it ends up being it's interesting okay. uh, that's how i would say i'm not optimistic or pessimistic <laughs> it's just fascinating to see where it's going okay let me ask you the other side um um you know assuming that humans don't self destruct over the next 30 40 years and yeah we don't have uh, a, like a global dictatorship rising or <laughs> we don't get taken mm-hmm. over by communists or whatever you know assuming yeah. at, 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 at some point society reaches an equilibrium where we're we're doing okay and people have enough freedom and there's enough innovation going on what's your optimistic scenario hmm. uh so this is book by David Deutsch I think uh Nawal was talking about it recently some um some infinity but I forgot the name of it but basically what that book is trying to do is that uh it's basically again a criticism of utopianism and what it's saying is that uh, the 
uh, modern society, which was the, the royal society, which started the enlightenment and all those things. Their motto was Nullius in Verba. And what they're promoting is this thing called fallibilism, which is based on the idea that uh, do not uh, believe, never believe in things, uh, consider ideas, but always believe that, always consider the fact that this could be wrong. So if you see a black swan, you should be ready to change your viewpoint. And that is the only stable ideology that you can have. So you should, all, and what they're trying to do is that in that book, it's a rational optimist kind of a book. And what they're saying is that when you're living in the present, it's hard for you to see the progress. But if you look at civilization as a collective, our knowledge is constantly expanding to infinity. And what he's saying is that every point is a new beginning to this uh, infinity of knowledge where we are understanding what the world is. We are learning more about the whether this is simulation or whatever bullshit that you believe in. Every person has their own answer to how the world is where it is today. But as a collective, our knowledge is constantly growing to infinity. So maybe it's hard to be optimistic when you're just seeing a very small part of it. But if you take history in general, there's a lot less violence. Um, even though the radical environmentalists would want to say contrary, but there are some parts of the world where we are doing better for the, the motories. Uh, even though there's some parts of climate crisis that we should be concerned about, it's not entirely pushed to one side. We are actually doing environmentally better in some places. And maybe as a collective, we are actually improving. And it's hard to see that because our brain is wired to see, uh, you know, to be more uh, pessimistic because in, in in the forest, when you hear a noise, uh, if you're a pessimistic person, you'll think it's a snake or a lion and run away. So pessimism is something that kept us alive. And now maybe in a world where we are much more safer, that pessimism is actually counterproductive. So maybe it's important to be optimistic. And if you look as a collective, we are actually improving, right? Like, for example, you are sitting in Barcelona, I'm sitting in India, we're having this conversation real time. And our parents or grandparents, they couldn't even imagine this. So if you look at a collective... Telepathy. <laughs> yeah yeah this is, this opening is a as... portal into the other side of the yeah. earth literally yeah so maybe we should be optimistic about it but it's it's hard i have a schizophrenic view of optimism and pessimism i just shift between pendulums you'll have a different i'll, I'll say something different based on the day in which you are doing the interview. <laughs> yeah <laughs> what's the meaning of life for you hmm Again, uh, I would encourage people to question it in a somewhat different way, which is so many people have lived on this planet, hundreds and thousands of people. Why haven't we ever ever stumbled upon one unifying answer of all the meaning of life? Why is it that there's so many different ideas? Why can't we just settle for one? Why is it something that we still haven't figured out? And the answer to that is something we don't want to figure out. Because if you figure out, say that, meaning of life is this one particular thing then there is something inside us that actually strives to prove it is wrong like for example if somebody says that this is a simulation then there are some people that always mean it's not a simulation because if it's a simulation then our free will has limits so i feel that what human beings value the most is the illusion of free will so whenever you say this particular thing is the meaning of life there's always going to be something inside us that want to ah, maybe it's not that maybe there's something else to the world we will never settle for one unifying answer because it's not a bug, it's a feature. If there is one unifying answer, think how bad it would be. Now we can come up with our own meanings. Uh, you can say that, okay, I believe in simulation. We are living in a simulation. My meaning of life is escaping the simulation. Whereas another person can say, my meaning of life is going to heaven and finding Jesus. And we can all come up with our own meanings. And it's good that there is no one unifying meaning. And uh, yeah, so that's my take on meaning of life. I think it's almost like uh, you know, the Alan Watts way of like, what's the point of music if it's going to end? The point of music is it's, it's just music. Like, uh, if it ends, it doesn't mean that, you know, it's not a important uh, experience to have. It's just like that. Like, the meaning of life is to find the meaning of life. Like, that's some of the traditional answers people would normally give. But yeah, I think it's just, it's like music. What's the point of music? Just There's beautiful. No, yeah, it's just that. That's life. So it's beauty, basically. Experiencing beauty. Beauty? I mean, it's a, it's, <laughs> it's hard to put it into words because it's not just beauty. Life is miserable at times. But yeah, very miserable yeah, yeah. sometimes, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's like that. 
and and we wouldn't want it otherwise you know that's the most important part that uh, i have learned that the struggles and you know those things are actually important because if it was just your eat cake reproduce kind of a world we'd just get bored right now we have we have some struggles we have some uh, we are way off better than our parents like most people uh, you know we are living in a time we are which is unprecedented in history so yeah i think best part is that we are now in in a position where every individual can come up with their own meaning of life back when you know there was enforced religion or where it was much more you had to listen to somebody else's answer of what is the meaning of life now you can find your own which is both equally dangerous because you need to be going to nihilism or some pathological ideology <laughs> but i'm optimistic for the individuals who find good productive meanings for life okay aj i'm going to soon get kicked out of this building because curfew is in an hour so i'm going to ask right. you uh you mentioned a lot of books today but uh, what uh, what would be like your top two or three book recommendations hmm. notes from the underground first of all because it's a very small book it's like uh, 100 120 pages and you don't even have to read the second part because second part is mostly a story but the first part is it's the best piece of literature i have ever read uh, second uh, i would recommend peter thiel's book 0 to 1 uh, other than that gerard is my uh, books are the book recommendations they are not easy reads it's it takes it's very hard to read like for example gerard has a book called uh, things hidden since the foundation of the world it's it's amazing uh, but the problem is to read him you need to have some idea of freud some idea of anthropology some mm-hmm. idea of history some idea of uh, you know literary theory shakespeare's work dostoevsky's work so you need some kind of backlog but if you're willing to put in the work then things uh, hidden since the foundation of the world is a great book i'm also a fan of watching good tv shows like for example the wire is absolutely amazing uh is it better than breaking bad yeah i seen breaking bad i'm a huge fan of vince gilligan's work i like better call saul more than breaking bad uh, which is also his work uh, but wire is on an entirely different level you cannot even rate them wow. together it's a separate category entirely and right now i'm watching another show of uh, david simons uh, it's called the deuce set in 1970s where uh, uh, where time square where prostitution and you know uh, sex work was made porn was uh, made legal it was uh, the time where all those things started and it's a very raw depiction of the life during that time he's very raw like uh, similar to dostoevsky there's a lot of shade of gray the wire is something that i would recommend to every single person uh, yeah david simon shows uh, then richard linklater his work is amazing he has a before trilogy which is before sunrise before uh, sunset before midnight It's an amazing trilogy, one of the best trilogies ever, mainly because of its writing. Yeah, so those are some recommendations. Well, AJ, you were uh, AJ. Sorry, no, I keep I keep confusing with my other friend AJ. <laughs> <laughs> AJ, you were the first guest uh, on my podcast about almost two years ago, I think. No, 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 a year, a year, yeah. a year and a few months ago. uh with together with Timo and I think uh you and Timo are back to back now on this podcast so the last episode Ooh, was nice. Timo and yeah yeah um, I don't know exactly what the schedule will look like but probably you'll be back to back but yeah you founded this uh, <laughs> this idea of me doing podcasts in my head and now uh now here yeah this was one of the best episodes I've done nice so, man it was great thank you very much uh always happy to be on again what's next for you What's next for you? What's com- coming up for you? Yeah, for, for me right now I'm just in that phase where I'm just, you know, preparing for the next launch. So I'm uh, like I have my Udemy courses. I'm investing quite a bit. Uh so I'm just, you know, preparing uh be- be- becoming more financially stable right now and investing quite a bit. I'm making good returns. And eventually I would want to I want to uh relaunch Binance Academy. Not sure if we're going to still focus on education as much as we wanted to maybe it's going to be much more focused on technology and mostly media company that's focused on ar vr uh, we want to do more education games uh, media tv show all those things that's one of the plans that i have hope to be more on vr and all those things but right now it's just this year is just i can't do anything in this year just invest read books uh, relax because the world is going crazy and <laughs> 
once we have some sanity i would want to you know go full guns places back again amazing um is there any specific place where people can find you or is linkedin your main uh i don't know discord <laughs> okay. uh but it, yeah i have discord communities you can find me on whatsapp uh linkedin and obviously twitter twitter i don't use that much but yeah mostly linkedin that's the only platform i had left because you don't spend too much time on linkedin you you take it because it's so shit <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> but their article writing platform is pretty decent so i just use it to write articles okay? yeah basically so i also only have linkedin right now uh, i don't even have yeah. twitter on on my device it's just on my pc yeah it's just for news yeah well man yep. thank you very much for this i really thank enjoyed this conversation yep. thank you see you soon bye see you soon man have a great time <laughs>